Well, good evening. My name is Prentice Lee, and I'm the superintendent at Community High School District 128. And on behalf of the Board of Education and the district and building leadership teams, our wonderful teachers and amazing support staff, and of course, our incredible kids, uh, we want to welcome you tonight to the first of two uh, public uh, presentations and overviews of proposed capital planning work that's been going on for some time um, in the district. And more importantly, I want to thank you for your continued support of the school district. Uh, over the years, working together, we have created two world-class high schools that are nationally and state-ranked, and we um, haven't done that on our own. Uh, that's a true partnership between the communities and the schools, and we just want you to know that we're very much appreciative of your continued support of the school district. So let me take a moment and introduce a few people before we get started tonight. Um, we have um, several of the board members are in attendance. A few of them are here as individual citizens. A few of them are here representing the board tonight and uh, may engage at some point with you during the evening or uh, participate in question and answers at the end of the session. So first let me introduce those two folks. Uh, board President Pat Brewery, Pat's in the front row. Uh, many of you may know Pat. And Scott Luce uh, here who is also in the front row. Sure. So, and we have several other board members here who are uh, here as private citizens this evening. Jim Batson. Karen Lundstedt, Casey Rooney, and who am I missing? Did I get everybody tonight? Okay, we've got everybody. And uh, we have uh, several administrators with us tonight uh, that will participate in the program uh, or also answer questions. So let me start at the district level, uh, just so I don't forget anybody. Uh, first, Associate Superintendent Brian Kelly is sitting in the back. Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, uh, Rita Fisher is also in the top row. Uh, Assistant Superintendent for Finance, Dan Stanley is here. Uh, our District uh, Director of Technology, Mick Torres is here. And uh, our wonderful Director of Communication, Mary Todrick, is also here. So uh, again, did I miss anybody in that room? And then, yeah, sure, give them a round of applause. And then of course our two uh, really outstanding high school principals are here with us this evening and you're gonna hear from them as part of the uh, presentation this evening. So first, our host principal this evening, Dr. John Gilliam from Vernon Hills High School, and then from uh, Libertyville High School, Dr. Tom Colentis, and Tom is right here. Okay, so did, uh, I think I introduced, and Mark Koopman is our Director of Buildings and Grounds, and then we have two folks that are working with the district on current um, capital projects and uh, would also be working with the district. Uh, if any or all of uh, the proposed projects are included. And first, we have Brian Schouts from uh, STR, that's our architecture firm. And then second, we have Jeff Masters from Gil Bain, who's also here. Okay, so I've been around the applause for them. Okay, well, one of the most important things to know, and I want to advance. One of the most important things to know as a preface is none of the required projects uh, the proposed projects will require a referendum and they will not require any borrowing so there are no interest payments. Dan's going to talk about the impact of that uh, later in the program this evening but those are two very consistent themes that we want to make sure that we hit throughout the program. So what we want to do this evening as we go through the program, Okay, we've really framed this as uh, a series of questions to answer, and then uh, when we're all done this evening, if we haven't answered your questions, we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. So what work is being proposed and why? What are the costs of that work? When will the work start and be completed? How will it be funded? And what is the impact to cash reserves? And finally, what is the potential tax impact uh, to taxpayers. So let's take a few minutes um, at the beginning and address some of those questions um, as we move forward in the program tonight. So first of all, what work is being proposed and why? The District 128 Board and Administration have been assessing and reviewing long-term LHS and VHHS capital needs for approximately five years. In the past few years, the Board has completed assessment, prioritized needs, and reviewed options to meet those needs. All current and or proposed projects will be paid from existing cash reserves and will require no borrowing. 
The highest priority was replacing the current, soon to be old, LHS pool and adding more on-campus parking at LHS. With significant current cafeteria needs at VHHS and continued rising enrollment, expanding the student cafeteria, adding classrooms and a STEM lab, and adding a second gym became priorities. Based on current rising enrollment and future enrollment projections at VHHS, the board is considering a conservative approach to the addition of classrooms with future options to add more classrooms as needed depending on demographic trends. At, LA, at LHS, already approved and under construction, completion of the new LHS swimming pool. Work is expected to be completed on the LHS swimming pool in the spring of 2019. Already approved and under construction, parking lot addition. An additional 68 parking spots on the west side of the property were approved by the board and the Village of Libertyville. These additional spots are much needed for the LHS campus. Under consideration, repurpose the current, soon to be old, pool. A multi-purpose physical education or physical uh, welfare and extracurricular activity facilities, including a dance studio and a wrestling area. This building and space at LHS is important for both curricular and extracurricular needs. At VHHS, under consideration, the existing cafeteria is um, small and uh, it's only able to handle all of the current VHHS students with a couple of significant accommodations. The cafeteria space must be expanded into the front lobby during lunch and the lunch periods are scaled back to only 22 minutes in length. John's going to go into that a little bit more in depth as his part of the presentation tonight. The expanded cafeteria and remodeled servery will be able to better accommodate the current and expected increase in student enrollment. Eight classrooms in a STEM lab are currently under consideration. An analysis of classroom usage was completed to determine the current and future needs for classrooms at VHHS. The proposed new classrooms will be able to accommodate both the expected increase in student enrollment and current curriculum needs. Second gymnasium and dance studio are under, also under consideration. Currently, VHHS has the same curricular and co and extracurricular programs as LHS, and as such, has the same space needs. The second gymnasium and dance studio will be able to accommodate all of these needs and provide for increased student enrollment. What are the cost totals for each campus and then overall? At LHS, already approved by the board and under construction, the new LHS swimming pool and uh, the LHS parking lot addition uh, come to a total cost for both projects of $22.5 million. Under consideration, repurposing the old uh, LHS swimming pool is estimated at $5 million for a total estimated cost of all projects at LHS of $27.5 million. At VHHS, under consideration is expansion of the cafeteria, the addition of eight classrooms, and a STEM lab, and the addition of a second gym. Total estimated for all, cost for all of those projects is $26.6 million. When would the work start and be completed? If approved by the board, projects would be bid at the end of January with bid awards at the end of February. To hit applicable construction cycles, Project work would begin late spring at both campuses. Tentative project completion dates are projected to be at LHS spring 2020 and at VHHS fall 2020. How will the projects be funded? 100% from existing cash reserves, no referendum, and no increased taxes to fund projects. In addition, since we are not borrowing money to fund the projects, there will be no interest payments for taxpayers. What is the impact on cash reserves? Current cash reserves are at $80 million. The total cost of all construction projects, including uh, the pool currently under construction and the parking lot is $54.1 million. That would leave a cash balance of $25.9 million or 30% uh, balance uh, as a percentage of district operating expenses. It's important to note here that the board has committed uh, to not spending um, cash reserves for uh, recurring operating expenses. Um, they have been um, very adamant about that point for several years, and they're very adamant about that point moving forward, and none of us sees that changing in the future. 
What's the potential and, uh, tax impact to uh, area taxpayers? Again, there is no tax impact. District 128 has no outstanding debt. There is no debt incurring to pay for these projects, thus also no interest payments. So uh, we want to take a few minutes tonight and actually uh, review the projects at both of the campuses. So we've invited uh, Tom Colentis and uh, John Gillen to be part of our presentation tonight. So at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Colentis, principal of Liberty High School. Tom? Thank you very much. Um, for us, two of the three projects that have been proposed, as Dr. Lee said, are already under construction and underway. So the first is the Aquatic Center, where if you've driven down uh, Park Avenue or 176, you'll see that construction occurring on the front of the school campus. Um, this is the uh, Aquatic Center, the uh, final design. We are in the final kind of push and stages where the exterior shell is being built and um, the interior work is being done. Um, what we're building there is a 50 meter eight lane pool with two bulkheads and bulkheads are just movable sort of walls within the pool that help you set the distances and shape the pool. Um, this is our most heavily utilized facility within our high school. It is used uh, by PE classes throughout the school year during the day. It is used by our boys and girls swim teams, water polo teams, and then by a, a wide variety of community groups, learn to swim programs as well. Uh, as Dr. Lee said, this is a partnership between um, not only does the school benefit, but the Co Libertyville community from the use of the pool. It's approximately $21.5 million. That was paid from with the reserves. It is under construction and uh, depending on weather, we, uh, if we have a really nice mild winter, which we're all hoping for, we'll be done in the earlier spring. If winter is a, a tough one, we'll be done in the later spring, but uh, it will open at some point in 2019. Um, along those lines, those of you that live in Libertyville know that campus parking has been historically a tremendous obstacle and issue for us. So we were able uh, to work with the village to create a plan to add 68 additional parking spots along the west side of the campus. Um, and that is a cost of approximately a million dollars. The work has begun on that in terms of all of the grading and all of the um, kind of setup in the spring when the weather warms, um, all of the final construction will take place. Um, our students are very excited about getting that completed by the uh, end of the spring 2019. So that left us when we have the pool um, and our new pool opens, our old pool will become shut down. It's at the end of its lifespan um, and it is uh, going to be shut down. And that creates approximately 16,000 square feet of space that was really in the heart of the campus. It's in the kind of the center of the building. So when I started, this is only my second year at Libertyville. When I started last year, um, the first thing, one of the first things that I did was we formed a committee of coaches, of teachers, of administrators, and what we did was we looked at our entire campus from kind of soup to nuts, and we looked at all of our student programs, our academic needs, and we comp compiled a master list of what are our building needs, what are the things that we have to have in order to continue to improve instruction, and in order to continue to improve the quality of services for our community. From that list, um, we uh, then worked with architects um, from STR, and we made recommendations to them about the needs of our facility, and they were able to take that and figure out how we could best meet those needs with the space that we had available. This is not adding new space to the school. This is not creating new structures or designing new buildings. What it's doing is repurposing the old pool space into new usable space for our students and our community. Um, what we have in design, and this is all under proposal, so the construction here has not begun, but um, as I referenced the comprehensive plan that we created and a facility needs assessment, we determined the best use of this space 
would be um, to divide it into two levels, and the lower level would be a dance studio and PE space. So we have um, a lot of dance classes offered during the day as part of PE. We also have a number of yoga and Pilates courses offered during the day um, through PE. PE is a four-year requirement, and students take PE freshman through senior year. Um, and we would be using that dance studio all day long during the school day for our PE dance classes, yoga, and Pilates classes. After school, that space would be used as our dance studio for our dance team, which is an IHSA sport. Um, we have varsity and JV dance teams that compete and practice from essentially August all the way through the end of February. And then in March, it would be used for our extracurriculars, our orchestra show, which is our big school dance show in the spring. And as well, we would be using it for when we have musicals, productions, as a place for our student artists to perform and practice. Um, the upstairs of that space would be used as a multi-purpose room for physical welfare classes during the school day. It would be used for athletic events and, and practices, not for competitions, but for practices after school. Specifically, it would be a good space for us to use during wrestling season as our main uh, practice facility for wrestling. And then it would also be used for competitive clubs, things like our robotics team, things like our fencing team, things like our debate team. When they have big tournaments and um, competitions, we would host them in this space. So both the lower space and the upper space would be used year-round, both during the school day and in the evening to meet a wide variety of student curricular and extracurricular needs. Uh, sorry, I could have shown you the, the details, but it's really just a big brown box. So that's the physical welfare space, the multi-purpose space, which would be the upstairs where the existing pool deck is, and the downstairs, the kind of purple box there, that's the footprint of the existing pool. And so that pool would be taken out and then a dance studio would be built roughly within the footprint of where the existing pool is. And again, that would be used for curricular and extracurricular dance, yoga, and Pilates programs. Okay, so the proposal on this is that it's approximately $5 million. Again, as Dr. Lee uh, discussed, this would come from existing cash reserves. The construction could start, uh, if all goes well with the bidding process and the proposal, it could start as early as um, basically school would end on Thursday, May 21st or 24th, right around that last week of May, and construction could start immediately following um, the closing of campus for summer vacation. The construction, because we're not building new buildings, but refurbishing an existing structure, um, is only supposed to take approximately a year, with the facilities being online to open in the spring of 2020, so approximately a year from now. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Gilliam. Thanks, everybody. Good to be here. Appreciate uh, a lot of familiar faces coming out tonight to uh, hear this exciting plan. Um, when we talk about Vernon Hills High School and the next few years, here's what we know. We know the students are coming, right? And we know that for a few reasons. First, we've been working with John Casarda, who is a demographer, uh, worked with the district for really over a decade and has been projecting uh, over time this influx of students uh, that we uh, are projecting. We also know that they're in District 73 right now. If you live in the community, you know that uh, politically we just passed a referendum for our elementary and middle schools to build facilities to accommodate the kids that will soon be here. Uh, and when we look at our own internal projections, uh, they confirm both of those pieces of data. Uh, we can put names to faces, addresses to those names, and those students are coming here. So we'll talk a little bit more about the, pro the projections. Uh, but in the end, uh, that information has led us to a, uh, a curricular and extracurricular utilization plan 
and a building facility that meets the needs of uh, the kids coming to our school. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the population and uh, most, most importantly, what's gonna happen here in the next decade. If you look at the pink box, that is the accurate historical enrollment of our high school over the last decade. So you can see that uh, over the last decade, we've varied between 1,300 and 1,500 kids. We've gone up and down a little bit over the years, but in the last handful of years, we have seen a pretty steep increase. And when you get to the upper right-hand corner of that pink box, you get to today. And today we're about 1,500 kids, 1,490 kids. Uh, so the question is, what's gonna happen in the future? Well, the two lines that go off into the future to the next decade represent two of the Cursarda projections. The one in red is the most aggressive projection. He calls it his C projection. Uh, and over time, you can see that if he pushes out the C projection to 2026, 27, we're over 1,800 kids. If we look at the B projection, which is what he calls his moderate projection, that gets us uh, out 10 years to about 16 and a half hundred kids. When we do our own internal projections, when we actually put faces to names and addresses, we're somewhere in the middle of those two projections. When we start to look at building um, projects south of 45, over by the mall, into the Cuneo Estates, that's going to add some more kids. How many? We're not sure, but we're pretty convinced we're going to be somewhere between those two lines. So what, right? So that information has really, in the end, led us to a comprehensive plan. And like Dr. K has done with uh, his building, I've done the same, where we've looked at uh, space utilization. How are we using the space that we have now? What do the programs, uh, in terms of curricular, extracurricular, co-curricular, what are their needs? And where do we see them moving in the future? Uh, and in that, then, we, uh, we have come up with a list of greatest needs. Uh, and when we sat down with Dr. Lee and the district administration and the Board of Education over the last couple of years and presented these, we whittled it down to really three basic needs. And so uh, our goal tonight is to show you those. <clears throat> our concept planning has really been uh, over several years. Uh, and you might, uh, might wonder how we're, we're kind of phasing in to these, these years now when we started back in 2014. If you walk to the front of our school, you know that there is a locker room that sticks out, right? And it looks kind of out of place. The reason it's there is because over a decade ago, we planned to build a locker room in a gym, uh, much like the gym that Libertyville built on the west side there. Uh, but in about 2010, when uh, the economy crashed, uh, we built the locker room and made plans to build the gym. We uh, in 2014, came back at this with the board. Uh, we worked with a team of design and um, uh, construction experts and put together a plan. And it's much like the uh, gym that we'll show you here tonight. In terms of the cafeteria and classrooms, uh, that's been something we've worked over the last 18 months. When we looked at our list of greatest needs, put together a uh, concept plan and then a design plan. Really, in the last half a year, we've put uh, thousands of hours with dozens of folks, and they're listed over here, district leadership, building leadership, teachers, students, student focus groups, student surveys, uh, and then some of the design and con contract experts that you see here today to put together uh, what we're going to show here in the next probably three or four minutes. So the cafeteria expansion. The cafeteria, if you walk into our school, most people will say, is that your cafeteria? Wow, that's a small cafeteria. I don't know if you've had that, uh, that reaction or not. But uh, there's a term called scope and reduction. And I think it's fair to say that when Vernon Hills was built, the cafeteria was one of the things that got a little bit shrunk in terms of its size. So we've known for a long time that the cafeteria is small. Uh, one of the byproducts then of that is that our kids have half period lunches. When students eat at Libertyville, they eat 50 minutes. When students eat at Vernon Hills, they eat 22 minutes, take a break, pass in hallways, and then a second group comes in and, and eats for 22 minutes. Um, 
You can imagine that as we have increased in size, that becomes more and more difficult as the lines in the lunchrooms become longer. Uh, as we started a later schedule, we shortened our periods by five minutes, which just put an additional crunch on our students to eat. Um, and so uh, the problem is real. Over time, we've tried to adjust. We've built some of the cafeteria into the foyer. So if you step right outside of these doors, you step into the part of the cafeteria, which is really just an expansion. Over the last couple years, we've put some eating areas into the foyer to accommodate some of the greater need. But our plan before you tonight is to really, in effect, double the size of the cafeteria. Our goal is to allow kids to eat for a full period. And our goal is to do that in a way where they're not rushed and healthier. One of the things that I've worked with with our team, our design team, and our students is to create a menu that is healthier also. Um, and we won't talk too much about that tonight, but for example, we're getting rid of deep fryers. Uh, we're gonna we're bring in conventional ovens that bake the food instead of deep fry it. Uh, so we're pretty excited about what we've designed. Here's the uh, image of the floor plan. If you look in gray, this is what is current. And if you look at this colorful area, that's building into the courtyard. So if you've been around our building at all, you know that it's really a square and in the middle of the square is a courtyard. And our plan is to build into that courtyard. Now uh, we won't build so much into it that we lose the aesthetics of it. We'll still have a pond, we'll still have some of the green space, uh, but this, will allow us then to just about double the size of the seating. So all this is new seating here. And then the servery, which is this space right here, uh, just about doubles what the current servery size is right now. Let's talk a little bit about the proposed gym and dance studio. I want to give you a, just an idea of what our uh, current um, curricular and extracurricular needs look like right now. At our uh, busiest time, which is winter for us, when we have gymnastics taking over one of our entire uh, smaller gyms, we are at 100% uh, capacity, curricular. So when I say that, I, I mean that in our gym and field house, we have six courses, uh, multiple sections of those courses over the day that take that entire space. Likewise, for our weight room, which is downstairs in our basement, we have three levels of courses over eight periods a day, 100% utilization. And then when we look at our dance uh, program, uh, which normally sits inside of that gymnastics gym, but when the winter rolls around, they get kicked out, spread into this facility, spread into the auditorium, uh, spread into the gymnasiums, into the bays that aren't being used, we are at 100% capacity in our curricular areas. So what that means for us as a school is student choice then becomes limited. Our goal is to create a curriculum and a process by which students get to choose the course of, the, of their interest. And as we start to tighten in um, our utilization, student choice disappears. And we end up making decisions based on space instead of what's best for kids. Our athletic program. Our athletic program mirrors LHS's athletic program exactly. Same number of teams, same number of spaces. When we have uh, our busiest times in the winter, we have five courts in our field house and gym combined, 12 teams practicing on those facilities. In the early spring when winter is over and we start to add soccers and lacrosse and badminton, we have 19 teams using five courts. Our current sport space uh, right now is used from 6.30 a.m. Practice time starts as early as 6.30 a.m. and they end as late as 10 p.m. So when Dr. K talked about uh, his pool being the, the space of greatest use, we look at our gym and our field house as our space of greatest use. So when we talk about need in our school, need for space, and need for the community relative to feeder programs, intramurals, open gyms, and so forth. It's the uh, gym and dance spaces that we're looking at. So our solution to that is to add a dance facility and uh, an additional gym. 
The dance facility on the right is actually has been planned since we built that locker room. That dance facility on the right would actually sit right on top of the locker room. So it was built structurally with steel and walls such that we could put a roof over it and have a dance facility. So that dance facility that you see uh, on the right would be really model uh, what Dr. Clentis said about his use. We have dance programs. We have courses online waiting to join as soon as we have space for them. We have extracurricular programs including cheer and dance, orchestras, musicals, so on and so forth that will uh, make the most of that space. Then just to the south of that gym, on the front of our building, so on the west side of our building, uh, now where you see the visitor parking lot and some green space would be an additional gym. It is the exact same footprint as the additional gym that was added to Libertyville about 10 years ago. So it is no bigger, no smaller. It has one main court that can be separated down the middle into two smaller courts will be used uh, obviously then during the curriculum day. Uh, we will spread our courses out. Dance will have a home. We'll be able to take courses like CrossFit, uh, some of our junior and senior leaders courses and give them a home. And then of course, uh, after school hours, it'll be the home for competitions from everything from volleyball to basketball uh, to badminton and so on and so forth. Here is a, an, an elevation of the facility as you look from our parking lot where you probably parked tonight. Uh, this is the entrance that you parked. This is the facility that I've said is already built, that locker room. The dance facility just goes right on top of it. And then to the south of that, as we look at the west side, is this additional gym right there. So the, uh, the, the face of our building will look uh, really like it's been meant to be uh, for years. That is looking directly from the uh, west towards the building. So again, there's the, the locker room that's been there for the last decade, the dance on top, and the additional gym. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, proposed additions to our classroom. We presented to the board uh, a couple times over the last year uh, some room utilization data, which basically says this. When we look at our curricular programs, the number of courses in the departments that we have, the teachers and the children in those seats, we're tight. When we work with uh, architects, they say that when you get to about 85% capacity, you are at a place where you are now making decisions, instead of what's best for kids, you're making decisions based on how do you cram bodies into rooms. And so for us, at this current time, we have five curricular departments that are at or near 90% capacity. We are at really a saturation point. And so practically that means when I look at a master schedule and I look at the social studies department, there are no openings in that department. It's packed. Uh, and we know, I showed you based on enrollment projectors, projections, it's only to get tighter. Um, another thing that has changed since probably we built this place, because there has been some talk about, well, didn't you build it for 1,600 kids? We have had all sorts of curricular changes, and probably the greatest is our need for special education uh, space. You know, you know, if you know education, the special education laws have changed substantially over time, which has meant more and more um, individualized or small group classroom settings, uh, and they all need space. And so that has e eaten into some of our, what would be traditionally classroom space. And then there has been some program shifts, most notably uh, shifting to STEM education, so science, tech, technology, ed engineering, and math. When you look at the, the choices that our kids are making in terms of the classes they're signing up for, more and more of them are making decisions, especially in elective areas, in the STEM field. So that means classes like computer science, classes like uh, design and implementation, whether it's um, applications, or uh, computer programs, science classes, and uh, AP science classes, math classes, more and more math classes. So as we look at those shifts and the changes, what we've decided to do is uh, build a wing, or propose to build a wing that is um, moderate in its ask, 
Uh, we could build anywhere the, the, the recommendation was from eight classrooms to 16. Uh, and so what we've settled on right now is eight classrooms in a STEM lab. Uh, the six general classes we will use then to fill the needs of departments like world language, mathematics, social studies, science, or uh, uh, English, uh, two multi-use science labs, and as the kids come and sign up for classes, they could be used from anything from chemistry to physics to biology, and then one STEM lab, uh, which on the picture to the right is the one sticking out closest to us. Really, in theory, it's, or in practice, it's, it's the size of a double science lab that has some unique and high-end lab equipment, and also then an instructional space that is um, able to be used for all different kinds of settings, whether it's AP research, whether it's entrepreneurial work, whether it's computer science work, uh, that's where we'll go down in that STEM space. Here's a look uh, at that wing uh, from really the CDW parking lot. So that's east looking west. That's the other corner of it as you look more north. The footprint of the property then is what you're looking at now. The gym and dance facility, like we said, is on the southwest corner. The cafeteria then would add into the courtyard and then over by CDW on the north side of our campus would be where the instructional wing is proposed to go. Um, total cost of the proposed pod project is $26.5 million. And again, in terms of timeline, uh, we would begin uh, as soon as the bid uh, goes through and is passed, we would begin as soon as school ends uh, at the end of this school year. And our desire would be that uh, by the fall of 2020, so a year uh, you know, a year after next school year, we'd be ready to go with these with these three proposals. And that is Vernon Hills. Yeah. Thank you, John and Tom. Great job, and um, we appreciate all your work and the work of the teams. I just want to take a minute before we move uh, over to uh, Dan and uh, financials. Um, yeah, Dan, thank you for advancing that. So there are several things here for you to know. Uh, really, for Pat and I, uh, we really go back about seven years in terms of the initial conversations uh, about this when we were doing long-range financial planning, when Alex Stella Polly was on the board. And uh, we were able to map out that we were going to retire uh, some significant bonds from the building of Vernon Hills High School and the classroom additions at Libertyville in 17 and 18. And so at that point, the board really started to talk about uh, the future needs of uh, the district. Um, since 2014 to uh, current time, we have had dozens of board and board committee meetings focused on uh, long-range uh, major capital planning. Uh, more than 60 stakeholders have been involved in this process uh, over that period of time. Six separate design teams made up of those stakeholders and more than 50 design meetings. And what is important for you to know, one of the things that's important for you to know, is uh, that the projects have all been valued engineered. And let me use the example of the LHS swimming pool. With the pool that we really believed met the needs of our uh, physical welfare programs, our competitive swim programs, the community competitive swim program, our senior swim, and our learn to swim program there, um, actually came in initially at almost $30 million. Okay, and one of the stakeholder groups worked on uh, this project relentlessly and it was value engineered down to $21.5 million. So all the projects that we're talking tonight have gone through a value engineering process. Um, kind of our hallmark in our district is we have nice facilities that do what they need to do. We do not build Mercedes Benz in this district. Uh, it's never been the history of this district. It's most likely not going to be the history of this district moving forward. The facilities that are proposed are, are nice, functional facilities. They are not a $30 million swimming pool. So a number of things have been value engineered out of that pool, which was already value engineered down uh, from a higher number. And so that's consistent across all of the, the projects. I want to take a moment and talk about dance. Uh, because we will occasionally get a comment, I don't want you to spend any tax dollars on 15 or 20 kids that are in dance programs, okay? So let me take a minute and address that. 
first of all, dance is a critical part of our physical welfare program in the district. Okay, uh, I can tell you that my own two daughters who are LHS graduates took dance for all four years in the physical welfare or physical education program. So just to give you an idea on numbers, and these are from this year, by the way, at LHS and physical welfare, 233 students um, have taken classes. Five sections of dance, 154 students, three sections of yoga and Pilates, 79 students make up that total. In co and extracurricular activities, which would be competitive dance, orchestras, the fall music, fall or spring musical, um, we have had 161 students. That includes cheerleading, 43 students, palms team, 35 students, orchestras, 45 students, and the fall musical, 38 students. Total LHS student physical education and co and extracurricular dance related participants, 394 students. In addition, LHS is required to cap the number of dance related sections in its physical welfare program due to lack of available and safe space. At Vernon Hills High School in physical education, 142 students are signed up for dance related classes. Five sections of dance. In co and extracurricular activities, 152 students, cheerleading 31, dance team 36, orchestras 50, and fall musical 35. Total VHHS student physical education or welfare and co and extracurricular dance related participants, 294 students. VHHS is not able to offer yoga, Pilates fitness, or total body fitness in its physical welfare program due to lack of available and safe space. So roughly the total District 128 student physical education and, co and extracurricular dance related participants, 688 students or 20.8% of the total District 128 student enrollment. Uh, and I would suggest to you that we have a need in the dance programs to provide dedicated and adequate space to those programs. Now there's one other uh, complicating factor um, and that is, uh, we know from working with district council that we may have some Title IX issues here with the Office of Civil Rights. Okay, why is that? Because most of the dance program, okay, is made up of female students. And we do not have dedicated, adequate spaces to allow them to practice in the same facility night overnight. So let me put that in perspective. Imagine you were a football parent at Vernon Hills High School and we said, you know, next week the football team is going to practice on the baseball field. I think we'd get a reaction to that. So uh, at Libertyville, for example, the board actually added some additional floor space several years ago. It's more cushioned space. It's not a real dance floor. But we did that in the cafeteria. There's one problem. Okay? The ceiling height is so low that they cannot do lifts. Okay? And they cannot do, um, you know, some of the jumps and throws that they need to do. So uh, the Title IX complica uh, potential complication is that we have an obligation to provide similar facilities, similar access to our female students and programs as we do the male students. So whether we deal with the dance issue now within new construction, we are still going to have to come back and work through what we would do to create that space for the kids in the dance program. So that is important to know. Now we would say with the number of students in those dance programs and the continued growth of those programs and the things we're not able to offer as a result of our space limitations, that it's the moral and ethical thing to do. All right, but beyond that, okay, we also have some potential legal complications for not being able to provide those facilities. The last piece on dance is this. The dance kids, and Scott well knows this because his two daughters were in competitive dance, are the nomads of our school district. They are required to move around the building for practice space. Again, we don't have dedicated space. Uh, we don't ask the football team to move. Uh, we don't ask the basketball team uh, you know, to practice on the football field. We don't ask the wrestling teams to practice on the hard court of the basketball floor. So there are several compelling factors that are in that uh, decision-making process. And finally, um, what we are doing in actuality is very similar to what District 70, Libertyville, uh, 70 Elementary has done over the last few years. Okay, they have done building 
at a number of their campuses using reserves over the last few years. They have leveraged those reserves to take care of lawn care capital needs. It's a very similar process that we're talking about in our school district. So with those things said, let me introduce you to Dan Stanley, who is our uh, Assistant Superintendent for Finance. And Dan's going to uh, walk you through some financials, and I'm going to come back and just do a really quick wrap up. And then uh, we want to take some of your questions and answer those. Okay, Dan, I'm going to round of applause for Dan. Hi, my name is Dan. For, no, I'm just kidding. Hi, welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dan. I have the pleasure uh, of serving this wonderful, wonderful, fortunate district. And uh, like uh, Dr. K, we are both sophomores here in our employment at the district, and we're very excited for many years to come. Uh, so we want to just walk through the financials of what's going on. I know Dr. Lee already kind of said some of those numbers. We want to kind of put them up to let you see and be able to digest. So in terms of all of the major projects that we're talking about, both the, the big ones that are happening over at LHS already under construction and the ones that we're talking about and we're proposing really tonight. So if I go through the ones, starting with the ones that are already under construction, so these are approved by the board, bid out, bids awarded, and shovels, literally, well, lots of things in the ground uh, as of right now. So that would be the LHS Aquatic Center. That's at 21, point, not to exceed 21.5 million. It will not exceed 21.5 million. Uh, the LHS parking lot that was uh, done this past fall, approximately a million dollars to bring the total projects that are already done and in the ground, 22.5 million. When you're looking at the projects that we're proposing that we're talking tonight, so the LHS uh, old pool renovation and the work at Vernon Hills, the cafeteria, the gym dance facility, the classroom STEM lab additions, uh, that comes at a 26.6. So the total proposed construction that we're really talking to you about in a lot of detail tonight adds up to about 31.6 million um, that we're looking to pay, uh, pay for. So let's talk in terms of fund balance and how do you pay for this. Well, as many people know, the district has a very healthy fund balance. And so if you're looking at fiscal year 17, so when, even right, at that, right before we started uh, paying for the pool, Looking at fund balances right around $80 million. And so if you take everything that we're talking about, so the stuff that we've already approved and are in the process of, so the LHS pool and the parking lot, that's 22.5, plus the 31.6, which is the 5 plus 26.6. Um, did I say the number wrong? 31.6, yep. Add those together, you get $54.1 million <coughs> in total capital spending that we're doing. Um, with paying it with the existing cash reserves that we're able to do, that will bring the remaining fund balance to right around 26 million, which when you look at, um, what, what does that mean? Like, how, how do you give context to 26 million? Well, it's, if you look at um, the way, at least in school finance, we look at it, is if you look at our operating expenditures, the money that it costs us to run this district year in, year out, how much money do we have left in our fund balances as a percentage of those expenditures, what is that? And that would bring these to 30%. Uh, which is uh, certainly a very healthy and would still give the district very strong uh, financial um, ratings from the state and everything like that. So uh, that's, that's really a look at the fund balances. Um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about is there's other, there's other impacts and things that we're, we're taking into consideration with this. And some of this is really, so now I'm going to talk to you about the money that we're not going to spend or that we're not proposing to spend. Um, and that really has to do with the cost of waiting and the cost of borrowing. So let's take a look at waiting. So what if we said, you know what, this year, not a good year, let's wait until next year, right, to do this. Well, currently when talking to our construction manager, you could have an inflation or like escalation costs because construction costs go up year over year. I don't, do they ever go down? Not that, okay, now I don't see them go down. Um, it, that range could be 4 to 6%, we're thinking conservatively. So if you're talking on that, on the, on the, on the 31.6 million that we're proposing, we're not counting the pool and stuff because that's already done, bid, approved in construction. So this new 31.6, that could add a cost of 1.3 to 2, 2 million every single year and it compounds, right? You've ever heard one of the magical, most, one of the most magical things is compound interest, right? So that's something that we wanna keep in mind and we would like to avoid that, is, that additional cost. The second thing is on borrowing money. Um, this is an amazing district, and it is a very fortunate district to be able to afford cash for these. You don't find that very much. Um, it's difficult uh, to do. And so 
being able to pay for these basically $50 million, you're not borrowing money. And if you think about it over time, if you look at your own mortgage, right? So if you've ever done the calculations, right? If you have your mortgage and you do a 30 year payback on your mortgage, you look at what you've totally spent, you basically bought your house three times, right? Similarly, now our borrowing schedule that you're allowed to do by law is kind of limited really to 20 years mostly. And so, you know, it's not quite, you know, you bought, the, bought everything three times. But really, you're, you're doubling really the cost of the, the base cost. And so that's an important thing that we think is valuable. And we would certainly like to avoid an additional 50 million. Like, we'll just use the 50 million on these projects and avoid interest payments uh, for, the, for the future. Finally, um, a third thing that we would like to avoid is um, increased costs as it relates to splitting or deferring parts of this project. So uh, with the Vernon Hills, right, so you got things happening in all the different spots, right? Well, if we're doing these all at once, we, there's a certain economies of scale that we can get by having all the trades on site at the same time. They can coordinate the three different areas um, where we can consolidate the amount of steel. So we're buying more steel so we can get it cheaper. Um, all those things have an impact in terms of economies of scale that we would like to take advantage of uh, with these projects. And additionally, um, you know, as much as I love our professional services, uh, if we deferred or, or took longer, we would have to pay them more. Not that you're not worth it, you're worth every penny. Uh, but we would have to pay them more because it, it, in, a, in, in one sense, it's not really a whole, bit, whole, whole lot different cost for them to be here for two projects or be here for three projects. It, it's not a really big cost difference. And so if we did delay and said, you know, we're just going to do two parts now and one part later, we would have to pay them again to be here because it's really about the amount of time that they're here on site. And so if we can consolidate all that, those are the things that we're looking to take advantage of, really. Um, so in summary, right, all in a nutshell, the stuff that we're really trying to show you tonight is looking at proposed additions at Vernon Hills, 26.6 million. That's the cafeteria expansion, the classroom addition, and the gym and dance studio addition. At Libertyville, proposing renovating the old pool, making the... Uh, Physical welfare space on top, dance studio on the bottom, five million. Um, all plan to be paid from existing cash reserves. No referendum, no borrowing money, no tax increase. And even the question of, right, it costs money to build the thing, but then also it costs money to, you gotta pay for electricity for the building, you gotta pay for gas, you gotta pay for somebody to clean it, right? All of that stuff we do not anticipate having a problem being able to pay for. So. Uh, that's really the core of the information that we have to give you in terms of the financials. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Lee. So, uh, just a couple of other things before uh, we open up uh, for questions. So a couple of deadlines that are important to remember uh, in the process here. The deadline for board decision making to bid individual or all proposed projects is Tuesday, January 29th, which is our rescheduled uh, January board meeting. And the deadline for board decision making to actually award individual or all proposed projects is Monday, February uh, 25th uh, board meeting. There are four uh, opportunities for public engagement on capital projects. Of course, two public presentations that we're doing this week and next week at Libertyville High School. And then uh, we have several scheduled board and committee meetings in January and February prior to the board um, decision making uh, to bid or award uh, the individual projects. Um, in addition, uh, the standalone capital projects presentations with questions and answers will be videoed. So we are videotaping the presentation tonight. We will do the same at Libertyville next week and we'd be posting uh, those videos to the website. I would just note for the record that those videos have to be um, compliant, uh, ADA compliant, so it takes about seven to 10 days to make sure that they are. Um, and uh, as soon as those are done, then we'll be posting those up to the website. Uh, and as I mentioned, additional opportunities in February uh, to come at, uh, to the board meeting. And so uh, we'll be posting an FAQ, really designed, starting around the design of the presentation this evening. We'll also be posting that to the website and we'll be uh, adding to that as we get uh, additional questions. So um, that's what we have for our presentation and our overview tonight. And uh, I would say uh, before we start uh, doing questions, we've got a microphone that uh, we can pass around tonight. We would ask you the first question uh, that you just identify yourself and tell us where you live. You only have to do that once. So if you have several questions, 
You don't have to do that uh, each time. And then just to let you know that any uh, uh, Pat or Scott or any of the district administrators or the principals or our uh, architect or um, um, design group um, and uh, construction management group might uh, respond to those questions as well. Okay, so without further ado, if you have questions, Brian's going to walk the microphone around and I'll give the microphone to who's ever going to answer the question. Hi there, good evening. Greg Franz, Libertyville. First question I've got is uh, relating to the pool, um, the pool fix up, not the new one, but the old one. Did anyone evaluate, I, I know that we're putting another uh, a PE room up on top and it, you talked about to moving wrestling over there. What's gonna happen to the existing wrestling area? Um, is, is, has that been identified? It looks like we're gonna take it from one place and move it over to the other. I'm just, I guess the question I've got is what's the impact of, of only doing one floor instead of doing the two, uh, the cost on that, that impact, mm -hmm. okay? Tanya, you want to take the question in general? I have, I have a few more. Sure. I'll answer that one very quickly for you. The um, issue that we have right now is that we have to run many practices early in the morning before school and several practice very late in the evening um, because of the lack of space. So by us being able to move uh, wrestling over and out of the field house, it opens up additional practice spaces so that instead of having to schedule practices very early before school or very late, like 7 to 9.30 or 10 o'clock, we can run them at a normal after school. And we think that's better for students and for families. So it just allows some of our under-level and kind of multi-use uh, courts to be used by girls basketball, boys basketball, uh, some of the volleyballs and things like that. Thank you. Um, are all the bonds, and do we have any debt in the, in the district that they were retired in 2017-18? Is that a fair assumption? We have no debt. Okay. District has no debt. Um, approximately right now, how long did it take us to build up that, that $80 million reserve? And based on not where we're going forward right now, but the last couple of years, how much are we contributing to the reserve each year uh, of tax dollars over operating expenses, more or less? Um, I so sophomore year here, uh, I can't exactly speak to how long it took to build to build that up, um, but I just do know the last few years um, the district runs a surplus of a few million dollars depending on kind of the year. Uh, we're still waiting for finalized finalized numbers for last fiscal year, uh, so that's that's really where we're at. And is there an optimal amount of what the board and the school district district is expecting in terms of where they want that reserve level to be, as opposed to just more? I'm just curious. I, I if they. Okay, you can hear me. I think Dan or I can answer the question or any of the board members here. Really, the board has had a lot of discussion over the last three or four years about what is the appropriate level for that reserve. And they're comfortable with that 30% number. We think we're in a good place, Greg. And actually, that number, dollar-wise for us, will still put us in, the, you know, in a good place. Um, you know, if, if we had some catastrophe in the district and we had to address the, uh, that catastrophe, we would not have to come back to you as taxpayers to ask you to replace a roof in the middle of the winter that went out or something. So, and uh, you had mentioned that the OPEX, the operating expenses, uh, will be more than covered by, I would mentioned the additional operating expenses related to all these facilities is coming out of that $2 million uh, surplus uh, from each year that was contributed to the reserve. You've, got, you've done a lot of work on this, and you know I'm, I'm impressed, to say the least, number one. Number two, I think the, the argument for Vernon Hills is very compelling considering the, the population increases. But I guess the question is, is that do we have a number you talked about in general, hey, we'll be able to cover the operating expenses, the lights and the pool and everything else. Do we have a, a, a rough estimate of what that might look like in terms of additional operating expenses that relates to this, the, 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 all these uh, construction plans? We'd have to get back to an exact number, but we know relatively the square footage that we have of the district, and so we know adding X amount of square feet per these projects, um, are the, that cost, I don't want to say is not material, because all those costs matter, but that, that wouldn't impact our operating expenditures to a significant degree. In terms of the heating and the electricity and everything, the, um, the cleaning is an example, right, that's going to have to get cleaned. Uh, those are things that... I'm also left to look for right now. We contract out for this cleaning services, so that's really something we're working out with our uh, contracting company to kind of figure out what the price would be. Thank you. Go ahead, Pat. Here. Hang on, Pat, because we're on tape, so. 
Go. All right, so I just want to make a few comments on the on the surplus. So really, I mean, that surplus has been built up since the history of basically Vernon Hills High School, which is plus or minus 20 years. So that it used to be 120. So no, that Jerry, again, you're going back. You're going back to the surplus, which includes the early taxes. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. So um, the second point I want to make is from a reserve philosophy. All right. We are comfortable holding reserves at about 30%, okay? But, you know, going forward, 30% of today's budget is not 30% of the budget five years from now. So we've already had conversations that every year we will have to run some small favorability just to keep that reserve flat at 30%, okay? And, and strategically, that's what we want to do. I mean, we've been working, and I think if you look at our budget performance over the last several years, We've been trying to narrow uh, that gap between um, what we receive in taxes and what we spend. We, we want to match revenues and expenses. Um, the only difference between those two would be what we need to continue to do to add the reserves to make sure we maintain that profile of 30%. If that makes sense. Do you, want to, do you want to comment a little bit? Because there's recommendations that come out of the state about percentage. 20. So what people should have. Right. Right. So, so, and that's true, and we're slightly above that. Okay, our target of 30% is slightly above that. I, I don't know about you guys, but at least I, for one, am not usually one that feels comfortable um, with what the state recommends when it comes to a lot of financial matters. But um, I think I think slightly is probably uh, understating uh, when you, when you're 50% over the, the the legal the the state required reserves. Okay. I mean, I, 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 and once again, I, I I get it. I just want to make sure that as we go through, we want to keep on contributing to the reserves. That and all of a sudden we're building up to 80 million dollars. And, and there's this this just real yeah. quick. And I'll be done. There's a fallacy that goes through that says there's no tax increase. Well, it sounds like there's no taxes. We, 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 what we've done is through these $80 million of reserves, people have been taxed. And that, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that sticks in my craw is the fact that we sound like there's a free lunch out there. And there isn't. And, okay. and I know building is, ex is expensive. But I really want to go through and see when that reserve we go, go, to, go to 30%, we just don't keep on building that reserve up and say it's 30%. Let's go through and try and, and, and try and give a little bit back to the taxpayers in some, some small measure, even if it's tokenism, it, it, it shows an honest effect to the, uh, of the, the contribution that we make to this community. All Thank right. you. So again, a couple points that I think are important to make. Um, you know, number one, again, we have no plan strategically to increase the reserves, and I'm going to define increase the reserves over that profile, okay? Um, second thing is, uh, we are all taxpayers and we feel your pain, okay? I, I certainly do. Um, third thing is, um, you know, over the last, it was really not last year, it was I think the four prior years that, we abated $18 million, okay? We did that strategically for a very important reason, which is we really had to find a way where we could, in this case, we couldn't give money back to the taxpayers, but we could choose not to take money from the taxpayers. Essentially what we did is we used our reserves to pay off our mortgage. Okay, because we knew once that mortgage was paid off, those expenses would not recur, and so we wouldn't put ourselves into any long-term jeopardy as, as far as as far as our financial situation goes. Okay, so um, the only other comment I'd make is, you know, going forward, I, I think we're certainly willing to look at that 30% profile and continue to ask the question whether that's too much or too little. Uh, I would say at this point, strategically, we would still want to be conservative, okay? We have been conservative in this plan, building eight classrooms, okay? I wouldn't want to get 10 years down the road and find out that I need a few more classrooms because they renovated Hawthorne Mall and, and now there's even more people in the district and all of a sudden we've bled down our reserves, okay? So that would be my reason for saying we're still going to be a little bit conservative. But I can assure you there's nobody on the board that says we want to build the reserves back up to $80 million. That's absolutely not something we want to do. And Pat, I, I would add to that over, this is my close to 15th year in the district um, moving forward. And so we've had a number of iterations of the school board. We've had a number of members come to the school board every two years. We've had some members that resigned and then the board appointed members to come in. That conversation has been very consistent across that group over the 15 years. That we want to, you know, what is the right number? Uh, so we really, Greg, we've probably spent a couple of years really digging in, you know, to what the correct number is uh, for that. And as you know, we live in a state with a lot of uncertainty. So a couple of years ago, it looked like 
There might be a property tax freeze, which would be great for the homeowners, but would cut revenue off to property taxing bodies, right? Um, and it also looked like we might get a pension cost shift, where part of the pension cost of the state, that's the state's obligation, would be given back to us locally. Either one of those things would have some pretty substantive effect on all school districts. Together, they would be catastrophic, and on top of that, we went for two years without a budget, so we didn't know what we were gonna get from the state, really. So I think all of those things play into ongoing conversations, but um, probably five years ago, when we really started to dig into that, the conversation was, even if we went below 50, we were pretty nervous, you know, because we didn't know what was gonna happen at the state level, what costs we were gonna have to pick up locally. And so uh, through those conversations, we've really come to that 30% number in terms of a, you know, a funding platform, and it's something that the board reviews every year, and um, you know, we'll continue to do that. And I like you, I'm a taxpayer in the district, so you know, I've got dog in the hunt too, just like you do, so. And one last thing, not to yeah. get it off track. Sure. Just to make sure we have time for just to get out Yeah, and not to get off track, and I know the pension thing is a, is a big issue, and I'm not so sure that even 30% would do anything if, if, if the full pension liability was, was, was thrust on every district to, to even come close to covering the, the, the thing. So that's, a, that's another complicating factor but as it relates to this right here. I get it, I just wanna make sure that the residual and as we start to go through and get our OPEX in, in line, yep. that the excess isn't just either we find something else to spend it on but we, we, we take a look at it and say can we go through and defer mill levy increases on the taxpayer as long as possible and uh, just one certainly understand and respect that one clarification I just want to make so in terms of uh, fund balances and state requirements really what the state has is a minimum requirement and essentially what that basically is is if you have less than 25 percent then you get kind of notched down in terms of financial strength. And if that number gets too low, you know, then there's other things that, that would happen with the state. So really in terms of the state, it, it's really more of a minimum requirement that they really care about um, that, and they really, really focus on. So. That's right. One last thing, this is more of the state, but I, I really wanted to be on a watch list how much, how much uh, as impotent as this state is, how much they really they could exact any sort of measure uh, of pain on a school district. As, as poorly as they're run. And, and really, we, you, you see really a political you, statement, but we appreciate that, okay? Fiscal. You'll, you'll see that in Lake County, North Chicago went, went through something. So essentially what they would do is if you get to a certain point that's solo, they send, um, they basically essentially remove some of the board, some of the elected board's power and give it to an appointed board that is in the, and the idea is to try to make positive changes to turn that district around. So that's really practically what would happen, which what you've seen in with our neighbor North Chicago that happened for years. So Ron Lake that's too. really what would happen in that situation. Happened to Round Lake too. Right, so and East St. Louis. There you go. Uh, my name is Heather Lease. I have two properties, one in Vernon Hills and one in Liberty Hill Choice District. Uh, four kids, two at the high school now and two in the elementary school. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the school and the school board for being proactive with this space issue. Uh, my kids in elementary school are hurting now because of it. So I'm very glad that you guys are looking into this now. Um, my question is, what do you need from us to move it forward? You know, I don't want to delay. I don't want to have this pushed out years to where they're getting in the school and still under construction. Well, I think as we kind of lay the timeline out, the board's going to be doing decision making to bid the awards in January, you know, either individual or all the projects. We would, you know, we're, our recommendation is that we move forward, um, you know, with the list that we provided tonight. And then in February, they would actually award the bids. Now, here's why those two dates are really important. Uh, you remember Dan talked about the cost of waiting. Okay, there's a construction cycle that we have to hit, okay? So if we go beyond February, we're going to miss the next construction cycle, which is going to drive us forward another year, which is going to cost us several million dollars on, this, on the size of the project that we're doing. So uh, I think in answer to your question, it's probably just to let us know that, or let the board know that you're supportive, right? Yeah. That's, that's it. Okay. Uh, well, I as know tons of people, everybody I speak with supports. I know that there's a little, um, I guess there's a Facebook 
mob page that's out there complaining about the studios, but um, everybody who I speak with supports all of it, including the studios. Well, and the, again, the, the dance numbers yes. su support those studios for that reason, and then again, we've got the potential legal entanglement. Well, sure. we're going to have to take care of that problem anyway, somehow with the existing space, if we don't construct space within construction. Right. So, okay. appreciate well, your comment. Done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Question over here, Brian. Um, thanks, Dr. Lee, for the really nice, uh, comprehensive overview of the projects. Um, two questions. Uh, David Ludoff, sorry. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm Vernon Hills. Um, first would be in the design of all of these additions, was there a consideration of energy efficiency or lead certification on, on these facilities? Um, I think it's important as a progressive um, community that we think about how we're building new buildings and making them as energy efficient as possible. So I'd like to hear from the design aspect whether that was considered um, or if it will be incorporated into the design. That's my first question. Okay. Yeah. Who wants to answer that? Um, we are <coughs> here, Brian. Oh, we're taking, so we've got to have you on the microphone. Yeah, just stand up, Brian. Yeah, it's okay. We will be building these projects to the current energy codes. Um, they're quite stringent. We are not meeting any lead. Um, it was not a direction that we were given, but um, they will be energy efficient. We also are looking into the solar on the gym and we're working with the district to get that implemented. We are building the gym roof to hold solar panels for future if this district money or this, this grant comes through for that. Um, so we're looking at alternative ways, and eventually, if we did get the solar on the gym, we could apply the project towards a LEED certification. So right now, there's not money set aside to make f for, the, for the solar panels. It's in the future, if it that's going to be in addition. Right. Uh, some, of, some of that is, is timing, because really, um, to kind of secure some of that, there's a process to go through, and so we um, try to be really intentional about the construction cycle we're trying to hit. And so th th those things don't necessarily have to line up. And so the idea is if you have it ready to be able to do when when those other timelines line up, then we can do that at some point. Because it's grant money. Correct. Yes. So the comment Pat made was we could use grant money to do that. We certainly would do that. We would certainly look at doing that. We're preparing everything for that possibility. But you have to apply and do that. Right, exactly. There's an application process and approval. Go ahead, Brian. We're also working with um, ComEd for an energy efficiency and program. Um, I think we have a kickoff meeting soon. Yeah, today. And um, I, unfortunately, I didn't attend it, but our engineers did. And so I'll get the rundown on that probably tomorrow morning. And so we'll be getting a lot of energy efficiency credits and towards the design that we've worked on right now. Okay, thank you. Second question was just, with the increasing enrollment um, here at Vernon Hills, has there been any discussion about um, increased parking? And I know that's like not as important uh, when you think about the when you think about the buildings and, and what we're putting in place for to help the, the kids. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know the parking's always been an issue here. We have to park across the street and uh, things like that, which is fine. I'm just was wondering if there's been any discussion about creating more parking spaces or if that's even something that's been considered? Well, I think the honest answer is parking's always an issue and um, certainly at Libertyville, it's been an issue, so we understand the parking issue pretty significantly. Um, anything that we would do in parking would be beyond this project because this really takes us to the limit and again, kind of the 30% that we're comfortable with uh, and allowing us to have the facilities that we need to have for now, but you know, anything's on the table for future conversation at either campus. John, go ahead. And I'll just add this, just practically speaking, our staff parks on the east side, and currently there are still 10 spaces available for, for staff. So as we build in student enrollment and in staff, those spaces are gonna uh, be taken up. So we'll be, we'll be thinking about 
uh, moving some of the district vehicles, some of the dumpsters to create more space on that side. On this side, on our west side, is where our seniors park and some of our staff park, and those, those spaces are filling up. Fortunately for us, we do have access to the park district parking up, uh, you know, up south, up on the hill south of us. Uh, and I know that uh, you know we've gotten their approval to continue to move into their spaces. Now, you know, our children aren't going to want to walk that far, but our children can walk a certain distance and be okay. So I think in terms of parking, we have awesome neighbor, neighbors, and you reference the fact that sometimes we have overflow parking in some of our neighbor facilities. They've been great to work with. I don't see a reason why they wouldn't continue to allow us to use parking spaces in nighttime events, but uh, we're pretty blessed in that way as well. Yeah, we're very fortunate. In comparison to most other high schools in Lake County. Hi, my name is Jerry Verbaden, and uh, to some of you, I'm unknown. I'm, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you from the standpoint of taxpayers. I'm 73 years old. I've lived in Libertyville for 40 years. And uh, I built two homes in Libertyville, and uh, I'm currently paying $20,000 a year in taxes. I build nice homes. I build homes that right now, uh, if you were to go to tax assessor, they'd say your street value is uh, $832,000. Well, guess what? I'm trying to sell it right now, and I can't get $700. I'm going to tell you, your point of diminishing returns is here. Everybody used to say, well, the taxes are high, and the taxes are high, but we got great schools and that's why they're so high. And I bought it. I bought it as a young guy and I worked my hind end off and I turned right around and built new homes. Well, I'm telling you, it's changed. Put your homes on a market, particularly if you got a home that's somewhere about six hundred and fifty to $800,000. Put it on the market, see what you get for it. All right? Now, I spend, I spend, uh, $20,000 a year in taxes, 75% is for schools, schools, okay, so I'm about a $15,000 taxpayer. I haven't had a kid in school, for God's sake, in 20 years. Oh, well, I put kids through school, okay, so the lady up there who's got some kids in school and, and uh, she's got a home, maybe it's about $400,000, $450,000. And she's paying 75% uh, of her tax bill, which is about 10, 11 grand, and she's paying $7,500, right? And she's got a kid in high school and a kid in grade school and a kid in high school. Guess what? Her bill is about $3,500 in taxes. Now, what's the cost of a kid in District 128 per year, per taxpayer? Take your budget for taxpayer. Would take be your budget and buy and divide it. Don't give me the, the state. Tell me one thing. Or no, I want to know what your operation budget is, your educational budget divided by how many students you're currently educating. Yeah, certainly, and I don't. I don't mean to give you an unclear answer. Uh, so, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's around twenty-three thousand dollars. Is the operating it, expenditure per pupil? I thought it was closer to twenty-four thousand. It certainly could be right there. Isn't that a lot of money? $25,000 per kid, per year, per taxpayer? You know, I get the biggest kick out of this thing, and we sit here as people, and there isn't enough people here to talk about this. We sit here with people, and they're talking about parking. Well, think about it. How much are we paying for busing? How much? Oh, we don't pay. I'm sorry, the state pays, the taxpayers pay. How much do we pay? Uh, be clear, we definitely pay, but in, in terms of that, you're talking somewhere in the range of 1.8 million-ish? 1.8, what's our, what's our utilization? In terms of how many students run the Yeah. Bus? Sorry, I don't know that answer. About 30%. I don't know. Okay, and we're saying, 
What I'm saying is, suck it up and tell some of these kids who want to drive to school, no, seniors only. We've got X amount of parking spaces. Bus it. I walked. I'm a <laughs> 73 years old. Sorry, pardon the French. You know, Doc, I've always told you guys, you do a job educating. I've, inter I've inter interviewed the students. They're, they're, they're very well. Director of curriculum, great job. You're doing a great job with the kids. I'm not knocking that. But you're taxing me right out of my house. I'm moving. Okay? I'm one of those people that if I had my choice and if I didn't have grandkids here, I'd be out of the state of Illinois in a heartbeat. And, and, you know, I love this when they say we need additional classrooms because the state has got their special, let's see, special education students and, and we're forced to accommodate them. <laughs> Tell the state to pay for it. We're not getting diddly from the state, right? With all, with all due law. respect, there are state laws I that tell laws. us what we have to do in terms of Especially it's any even transportation. So for example, state law requires us to transport students under certain circumstances. Well, I, that's I, something that we I'd have love, to do by law. I'd love to have somebody step up and say, stop it. Okay? That's what you're doing to us from a taxpayer standpoint. If that's a big part of it. You know, any other thing that I don't like? You know, you talked about the first discussion about a pool at Libertyville High School was, um, and this was back about 2014. Okay, when the surpluses were, and I don't know, we changed the definition of the name, didn't we? The surplus, what is it called cash now? Reserves. Cash reserves. The cash reserves back in then was somewhere about 100 to 120 million. You don't think so? I mean, what was it called? Do you have any idea? No, I'll give you a quarter off the top of my head. We just went to you. You're right. Wait, Pat. Wait. Wait. Because we're on video. You're right when I look at what? You're, you would be correct when you look at the fund balances at the end of any given month. Yes, those numbers were at, at one point over $120 million. But as we've explained on a number of occasions, that fund balance includes the early taxes we receive, completely analogous to if you look at my checking account on the first day of the month, on the day I get paid, yeah. it looks like I got a lot of money, but I haven't paid my mortgage yet. I haven't paid my bills yet. I haven't paid any of that. I know. So, and it so was like trying to hit a fly on something that was very hot. But um, we've had these surpluses of 100 to 100, you know, and, and now it's 80. And by God, we've spent $26 million on a pool. Okay, so, wow. We're doing good. We're back up to eight. You know, when I said in 2014, when everybody was saying, well, it's somewhere about 100 million, give it back. Okay, give it back. If you were to sit back and look at how many tax paying bodies you have in this area, and you took that 80 million less, let's say 20 million, 60 million, and gave them all a check for Christmas, how much would that be? Stimulate the economy, right? You know, I love to hear the architects. It's coming, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going to increase your cost. It's going to get worse. Geez, I'm reading things right now where they're talking about maybe a slowdown in the economy. And it ain't going to get worse. If we don't watch this uh, current presidential situation, cocking on it. But... I'm a taxpayer, I'm disappointed. I love the school, I love the community, but by God, we're, we're broke somewhere along this line, and I've said that since 2014, you won. You won. I, go to, I went to the same village board meetings in Libertyville, and you know what I got over there? Mr. Weckler says, well, we're doing a good job controlling our costs and taxes and blame it on the high schools. 
Blame it on the schools. That's a this one and that one and point and finger routine. Don't work. We all got a problem. And if you don't want to step up to and miss it, you'll be in my boat someday. You will be in my boat. And, uh, you know, I would only ask this when you look at the capital spending. Okay? What's your parent, what, what is your teacher student ratio? How many students per teacher? Depends on the program. <laughs> Okay. So in special, Jerry, in special education classes, those numbers oh, are No, no, more. don't not, go there. Not, but they are on, they are on our staff, so those numbers are lower. Okay. Some of our at-risk students are in classes that are lower. And some of your driver's education people are running four to one. Right? Or three to one. Four to one in what? Students. Oh, when you're teaching well, your you're right 12 kids, Jerry. Well, that's just, you can't fit more than that in a car. I'm, I'm telling you. Consider, consider, please, you know that you are one of the highest paid group of teachers in the area, okay? Nobody's underpaid in this situation, and I'll prove it to you, all right? I don't mind paying for performance. I'm not saying that, but the, the real issue is start looking at, you know, I was, I was educated by nuns. I think the ratio was 42 to 1. Uh, that's out of line. I'm not going there. But I'm telling you right now, consider something like that. If you gave one more student to every teacher, how much would that save the taxpayer? I don't know. So I've had enough. So, thank you, Jerry. okay, can we move on? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. All right, uh, another question over here, and then we have another one over here. Hi, my name is Becky Palmer. We're in Libertyville, but we're in the Choice Zone, so we have students here at sure. Vernon Hills. Um, for three of the four projects, it looks like they're fairly isolated. One will be done in roughly a year, one will take more of a year and a half. Um, just a question on the, the cafeteria expansion. It is literally right in the middle of your building. Um, during the school year, what are your plans to accommodate that project as you have students in the building? Great question. So as we've worked with uh, our construction manager and our architect, the plan is this, that we would hit it heavy this summer. So much of the shell and, um, and structure would be done in the summer. We would start the school year with the current servery as it stands. So there would basically be a false wall that uh, led into the, the new servery, but we'd be using the old servery for the remainder of that school year while the finished work would be done on, on the new stuff. Uh, then that next summer, the finished work would take place, the wall would come down, and we'd have time to open it up. Uh, so we'd be really practicing for another year with the old uh, servery and cafeteria space while they're, while they're building basically the new stuff. Okay, thank you, and thanks to all of you who have put a lot of work into these plans. We really appreciate it. Hi, uh, Tanya Reback, Vernon Hills. Uh, I just want to, my voice sounds really weird on this. Uh, I just want to um, thank and applaud the administration for the plans that you've put, uh, put out here. It looks like uh, obviously countless hours have gone into this and I think it's really, really important for our students. I couldn't be uh, more proud uh, to have two students in this district, and especially here at Vernon Hills High School. Um, and uh, you, Dr. Lee made a great uh, argument as far as uh, the dance needs are concerned, and as a parent of um, a dance team athlete, I, I just want to implore the board to strongly consider passing this. It's, it's so important for all of our teams to have equal access to be able to practice when they need to practice, practice in or on a facility that is correct for what they're doing. We have a lot of dancers that get injured on basketball floors because it, it's just not right. Um, but in the meantime, we have football players um, at both schools playing on gorgeous turf fields. 
So I, I implore you to give some consideration to, to these other programs because I think it's very important and um, as is all the rest of this, I'm um, very, very impressed and thankful. Just mainly about the, the tax issue that you brought up. Uh, we do have, like I said, I have two homes now currently in the district, one in Burn Hills, one in Libertyville. Um, so I do pay a lot more taxes than what was referenced to. But the house that we have for sale in Libertyville now, the people that are coming to see it are not complaining about the taxes. They're complaining about the elementary schools. So they're too crowded. So. We are having people tell us no to buy our house because they're worried about the school district, not because of the taxes. Any other questions? Okay, uh, am I mic'd up? I think I am, I can hear myself. Okay, so uh, just in closing, again, on behalf of the board and everyone here in the district, we appreciate um, your attention to coming out tonight and uh, you making the commitment to do that. Um, if uh, you have friends and neighbors who would like to see the presentation live, we'll be at Libertyville High School next week, same night, seven o'clock in the Libertyville Studio Theater. You can tell people to put, the easy way to get to the Studio Theater is just park in the back lot at Libertyville, come through the back door to right up the stairs, you won't be able to miss us. You won't have to wind your way through uh, the building and all the additions there uh, to get there. But uh, if you want to encourage your friends, that would be great to see them next week. Remember, seven to ten days, the video from tonight will be posted, so you can also direct people there. And there will be a number of opportunities yet in January and February uh, with uh, board committee meetings and a board meeting in January and board committee meetings and a board meeting in February before the board uh, needs to make a decision. To, but, but the board is being very deliberative on this and uh, they are very aware of the timelines that we talked about earlier. And if we are going to move forward, the cost of waiting if we don't move forward. Um, and so uh, we all appreciate uh, you coming out tonight. I would mention one other thing, if you wanna plug into the district in a more detailed way, uh, toward the end of this week or early next week, you're gonna receive a second postcard from us and it will give you some instructions about how you can sign up to kind of plug into the district. If you're not a parent and you're a resident, you're not getting some of our other uh, information, you'll get notification like the two villages do of when the board meetings are, uh, documents for the board agendas, those kinds of things, our e-paw prints, our, our e-board uh, briefs uh, after the meeting, and any other uh, important information. And again, uh, the board and administration believe collectively, and we have uh, worked hard to demonstrate um, our desire to be transparent and to um, interact with community members. And as, as Jerry knows, we may not always agree, but we'll always listen and we can always have a conversation um, moving forward. So uh, if you'd like to plug in that way, you'd have an opportunity to do that. Uh, when we get into budget season and we get into uh, levy, uh, some of the other important financial decisions that uh, we make in the district. So uh, we want you to be informed. We want you to be a part of the process. And if you ever any, have any questions, just call us the district office, okay? One of us all. You know, myself, Brian, Dan, Rita, one of us will get back to you and have a conversation with you, okay? So if we don't have any other questions, thank you and uh, have a great evening. Okay.